Yes. Okay, thank you. I am uh, Paul Ravindran, a medical physicist, actually a retired medical physicist to be precise. I was working at the Christian Institute, uh, Medical College, Velour in South India for 1986 and retired in 2019, spent a year plus at IAE as a consultant and then came back. And after the pandemic, I took up a job as a physicist and a, a principal of allied health sciences at the Christian Institute of Health Sciences in Dimapur. So that's about me. And uh, again, thank you for inviting and it's a great honor and privilege to talk to you. I'll be talking on stereotactic radio surgery and radiotherapy. I will explain the technology and the techniques that I have learned. One disclaimer, for the last four years, I haven't had a chance to work with stereotactic. So most of the thing I will be presenting are a little older uh, data. I mean, what I did in Christian Medical College Velour a few years ago. The other disclaimer is uh, I have now worked with Gamma Knife, but I read a lot about it. So I'm talking about Gamma Knife too, but those images are taken from publications. Uh, I will try to acknowledge most of them. One or, one or two, I couldn't find out the source. So they are left as it is, but they are not my images. I need to acknowledge that those images have been taken from uh, publications. The contents, the way I'm going to discuss today, I'll start with some genesis of stereotactic radio surgery and uh, we'll provide you the concept. I will talk about gamma knife radio surgery. Then I will talk about lenac based radio surgery, which I have done significant amount of work in India. And uh, of course, I'll give an introduction to cyber knife. What I understand is uh, you have cyber knife radio surgery in Pakistan, I heard recently. And probably I may not be giving you a big information. You may know much better than me. I'll talk about in between. I'll talk about some quality assurance procedures and also give you a basic input on stereotactic body radiotherapy. What is stereotactic? This uh, probably the slide I made 20 plus years ago. Uh, stereotactic is stereo basically means three dimensional. And the dictionary meaning of tactic is art of maneuvering in the presence of an enemy. So the stereotactic, I will say that uh, it is a three-dimensional art of achieving what you want to achieve by irradiating the tumor. Um, stereotaxy is how it is normally explained by neurosurgeons. I just for fun, I changed it and I'm giving like this. Uh, stereotactic irradiation can be classified in both as external beam and stereotactic brachytherapy, but our most people work on external beam. There are only a few uh, centers who have done stereotactic brachytherapy. So in the external beam stereotactic radiation, we can see stereotactic radio surgery, which is usually single fraction and stereotactic radiotherapy and stereotactic body radiotherapy. I'll try to explain the difference between stereotactic radiotherapy and body radiotherapy. What do I mean by saying that to these two things. Going on to the basic principle of stereotactic radio surgery, it's a technique for the non-invasive destruction of intracranial tissues or lesions that may be inaccessible or unsuitable for open surgery. You know, this is the idea with which the stereotactic radio surgery started. Some of them which are inaccessible or unsuitable for open surgery, they wanted to almost eliminate the tumor. In radiotherapy, we treat the tumor. But here, the idea is to eliminate. That's why the name radio surgery, also it was invented by neurosurgeons, so obviously they would have called it surgery. The open stereotactic method used for actually getting the biopsy was the basis on which the radio surgery was developed. Uh, some of you who have uh, known about uh, the biopsy they do in uh, neurology where they put a needle through an ox system directly to the point of the tumor and pick up the tumor for a biopsy. The same idea was used initially for stereotactic radio surgery. The principle of the instrument, the target in the center of the semicircular arc made it very easy to adapt to cross-firing technique that was at that time available with radiotherapy. Going back to the genesis, how it started, uh, considerable progress was made in establishing radio surgery in the early 60s itself. 
and uh, Professor Loss uh, Lapsen actually acknowledges this was possible mainly due to the contribution of physicists called Kurt Leiden and Boji Larsen. You know, the, in the paper that I have said here, he actually mentions a name because of them, he could make significant progress in establishing the stereotactic radio surgery. The first proton beam radio surgery was performed in Uppsala. And even though heavy particle radio surgery with proton was an excellent treatment, uh, with the, but the problem was the synchrocyclotron was too big, too clumsy for them to use it. You know, you need a big setup for it. So hence they thought about a practical, precise and simple tool to use for radio surgery and thus the gamma knife was developed. The first gamma knife was built in 1967 under the direction of Dr. Lars Lexer in Stockholm, Sweden. And this had cobalt 60 sources in a uh, you know, hemispherical uh, setup and it was installed in Sophia Hemet Hospital there. And this was the first dedicated unit for stereotactic radio surgery and was primarily intended for use in radio section of section of deep fiber tracts or nuclei. This actually produced a dose distribution, which was most of a disc shaped dose, mainly because of the arrangement of sources and the collimators. It was not a circular one, it was more of a disc shape. So it was suitable for certain type of tumors at that point in time. The second unit was constructed and installed at Karolinska Hospital in Stockholm in 1974. This had a spherical field which made more use of, you know, versatile for use and had about 179 cobalt 60 sources. It, the collimators were of circular cross section of 8 millimeter and 14 millimeter in diameter. Later on, they made one 4 millimeter collimator also. The patient was fixed at an inner helmet and adjusted to bring the target to the focal point, you know, where all the cobalt 60 sources, the target, that is the center point, the patient was brought in, which is explained in this, you know, figure. All these are made to meet at the focal point where the tumor is located. The inner helmet fixed the couch of the machine, which is driven by a hydraulic system. The third and the fourth units were installed in Aires, Argentina and in England in the 1980s, these machines had 201 cobalt 60 sources. And this system was, you, you know, the number and the number of sources and the arrangement was used for quite a long time. The fifth unit was at uh, Pittsburgh in 1987. And the, the sources were arranged such a way, they were 55 degrees to their normal. So the patient had to be tilted actually. And you can see in this uh, thing that these are the source arrangements. And later on, they made a model called the B model in which the sources were arranged a little differently. The couch was made horizontal and the sources were, you know, symmetrically distributed around. This is like in one direction. So the head had to be tilted as you saw in the previous picture. The, you model the patient slides into the machine and then upwards for because of the sources. And in this B model, the patient goes straight and the head goes straight into this. You can see the difference here. You will be able to appreciate it better. But the one, one of the problems they had when the U model was source loading also in addition to the tilting of the head. And most of them, they had to put the patient on a prone position. Whereas the B model, had a symmetric dose distribution, both from here and from the anterior as well as from the posterior. That made it much more easy for them to access. So what you see on the picture of the two one, this is the B model and the subsequent one, C model, all of them had 201 cobalt 60 sources and had helmets which can collimate the beam as they want. So these are the helmets and these had four different sizes of collimators starting from four millimeter, eight millimeter, 14 and 18 millimeter collimators. So these are the arrangements, uh, collimators and the, uh, the plugs that uh, uh, get the beam to the diameter. Collimator helmets and the plugs. How do you fix the patient now? You saw about 
the gamma knife unit, how do you fix the patient? Because we have to fix them stereotactically at a particular coordinate system. So the gamma knife radio surgery is performed with the base frame and actually that helps to fix in a stereotactic localizing frame. So when they, I will come to that part of it later, imaging part of it later, and where they do an image and get the X, Y, Z coordinate, three-dimensional coordinates that has to be set. So for that, they used a patient fixation device uh, called true neons. You know, you can see that this had vernier on it. So using this vernier, the same X, Y, Z coordinate that they obtained from imaging was set so that the beams are targeted exactly onto the tumor. So in both the cases in U model and the B model, these two neons were used, which had vernier here, and both in the X and the Z and the Y, all the three dimensional, you had vernier to fix the patient head. And subsequent models, they found it very difficult because every time they had to go in and set the vernier for a, another isocenter. So every time they had to walk in, so they brought in automatic positioning system. This APS moves the patient head to the target coordinate defined in the treatment plan using some motorized arrangement. They call it robotic movement is performed in by the six positioners. Each direction, one axis like X, Y, and Z on either side. You can see that these are the systems that were used. But this had a problem in that, in the thing was, the. It, it actually occupies some space, the motor and other things. So the laterally, the distance that it can cover was significantly reduced. But the accuracy was quite high here because these are all motorized uh, uh, positioning. The accuracy was much better in this space one. If you compare the, you know, if you look at the advantages of having an automatic positioning system, it sets and of course, you look at the pros and cons, APS sets the coordinates more accurately than the manual procedure since the system is sensitive to 0.1 mm. Like I said, it's one tenth accurate compared to the manual one. Uh, lower radiation dose because the people need not go in and set the vernier every time. And the patient couch automatically withdraws the patient 28 centimeters from the radiation focus between the shots to minimize the unplanned radiation. So when the movement from one isocenter to another isocenter has to happen, it withdraws and moves and then puts it back into the position. This is the problem I said for lateral lesions greater than 40 millimeter and inferior targets may not be reached in some cases. <coughs> I'm, I'm sorry. This is because of the motor and the arrangement, this become a little big. So there was, um, the play that it can have, the distance it can move was reduced. Sometimes it may be, it may not be possible to place a patient head to the APS because of broad shoulders. You know, people having broad shoulders, it became a problem. It was hitting the APS. And next game, the one of the recent models is being still being used with some modification is the perfection. When they made the model, they looked at what are the problems they had in the previous models that B and C, and then they wanted to eliminate. One is the automatic positioning system <coughs> had some limitations because of the motor and other things. So they wanted to make it very unlimited. You know, they must be go, able to go and treat any lesion around the cranial position. That was one of the things, unlimited cranial reach and radiation protection to stop. People should not be going in and setting it and automation of the full treatment process. Full treatment should be automated. So they made it two changes. One is the source arrangement and numbers. The way the sources were arranged, the sources were static at fixed location, 201 sources in same location, but only the collimator helmet was changed. But now they change the way the sources are arranged. I'll show you that. And then patient positioning system. From APS, automatic positioning system, they move to patient positioning system. See, in the automatic positioning system, the body is not moved, only the head was moved with the motorized arrangement. So that was also a bit of a 
a difficult thing. Of course, the patient can tilt the head, but still it was difficult. In the patient positioning system, the whole couch with the patient was moving. So that made it much easier for it. Here, they reduced the number of cobalt sources. They used 192 cobalt 60 sources. It was arranged in five concentric rings. You can see those. These are the five concentric rings in which they arranged. The distance to the source to the focal point varied because of this distance. It varied from 374 millimeter to 433 millimeter. And single 120 millimeter array ring uh, collimator was used. Just one collimator, you don't need to be changing the collimator. You know, this is a sector. And this was about in eight sectors. And these are the five rings in each of the sector you can see. And eight sectors were, you, these were all you know, um, around the patient. There are eight sectors in the same circular path. And 72 collimators, 24 for each sector, as you saw in the previous one. So if you count this, there will be 24 for each sector. And each of it will have 4, 8, and 16 millimeter collimator. And each sector has 24 sources. Some sectors may be fully closed, or it could, you, it depends on how you plan. You can completely close some sectors or keep them all open. And here, as I said, they had the patient positioning system where the whole couch moves. And hence, it was much easier. The head, not is the head to alone moving. So there was more, uh, you know, freedom for movement. It is not uh, the, the reach to any end, end of the cranial region was possible with this. The dose prescription with gamma knife was always to 50% because there's a steep fall off of dose. Usually 11 to 18 gram based on the size and location, except for a trigem where they used 80 to 90 gram and the collimator being less than 0.5 or even less. Uh, brain meds doses given are 24 gram, 18 gram, 15 gram for lesions less than 2 centimeter and greater than 2 centimeter but less than 3. And so it was for 15 gram, uh, 18 gram, and for 15 gram for anything less than between three and four centimeters. Let me go on to linac based radio surgery now. We looked at the gamma knife and uh, this was more theoretical because I never actually practically worked except uh, for learning purpose, I visited a couple of centers that had gamma knife. But linac based radio surgery is one that I was inv involved in India from the day it started. No, I was the one who commissioned. So always quite be proud of doing that. And we were the first hospital in India to have uh, LENAC based radio surgery, further based any radio surgery. It was in uh, 1995. We converted our LENAC, made it suitable for radio surgery also in addition to regular treatment. In multiple non core planar arcs are used uh, here. Sir, uh, excuse me. Yeah. We have a question uh, between. Yes, so, please. Uh, respected sir, what is the purpose of these sectors? The, the sectors which we have defined in the previous slides. The idea is basically to, uh, you can, because it is now made into sectors, you are, have more freedom to choose where you want to close, where you want to open. And the sources will move from four millimeter to eight millimeter and all. It is like the older brachytherapy unit, you know, the, where they had pellets, the sources can move. It is the same concept, right? So they basically made it very simple. The sources can be hidden when people walk in or the radiation dose to the patient is less because of that. And the other uh, reason is you have much more freedom in choosing the sources. That is uh, the locations where you want to irradiate. It gave you more freedom of uh, choosing which uh, one to be open, which one to be closed and things like that. So this is the basic idea here. Any other question? Yes, sir, you can carry on. Okay. So I'll go to the linac based radio surgery where it is usually they started with 10 to 40 millimeter diameter circular collimators. Things have changed over the days, but I'll go to the very basic. And we used to six MV photons using a Mavatron linac. At that time, some people used even 10 MB, but we were using 6 MB. And we used the BRW frame for target localization. And we use uh, 
as I said, cone based. Later we move to MLC based. I will show you both. We had to do some modification those days to DNAC. One is to attach a cone here. That was number one that we had to do. Then we had to, this is the cone. You can see that I can put the collimator here. And these are the collimators of various sizes. We had from 15 mm to 40 mm. We were not treating less than 15 mm at that time. And we also had a couch mount assembly, you know, the patient head mount, we had it. This is, this is an add-on to the couch. So every time radio surgery happens, we fix this on the collimator and put the appropriate collimator and then fix this on the couch so that the BRW frame can be kept. And the imaging, as the, which I missed in when I talked about the uh, gamma knife, because I thought anyway I'm going to talk here, was done with the BRW frame. This BRW frame has got nine rods, uh, six parallel and three cross rods. You can see a set of three here and a set of three and a set of three the other side. Now, what is the advantage of this? If you take a CT cut, you can, suppose the lesion is here, you will get its X position and the Y position from here, no problem. What you don't know is the Z position. How do you get the Z position with a particular frame of reference? So the frame of reference, this BRDB has some origin somewhere here. So with reference to that, to get the X, Y, let me say this is the tumor, where is the X, Y, and Z? They get it from the images. How do they get? You see these three rods are here seen like this. As you move the cut from here to here, this rod, the middle rod will move from here to here. So the ratio of the distance between this and this will provide which Z position the tumor is. So you, as you move and choose the tumor center, from this ratio, you can find what is the Z position. So now you have got X, Y, and Z position with reference to this BRW frame, which means when you go to the LINAC, you should have a similar reference frame to target the tumor center. Exactly. The other thing we normally do when we do a head and neck uh, radio surgery is to have a CT MR image also and do fusion, right? So that way, so that you can delineate the target very accurately. Except for AVM, other cases we always do an MRI. But when we started radio surgery, we mainly started for AVM, right? Uh, when we treated AVM, we did first an angiogram and then from the then we did a CT. So the CT the coordinates were up, obtained from angiogram and then fused onto the CT image. And this is the box we used. There are different types of boxes. This box we use for uh, QA also. And this box has got uh, fiducial markers on each of its faces. As you can see in the lateral as well as in the anterior, you can see the fiducial markers. There are eight fiducial markers making a square and another smaller square here. The smaller square, actually it has got only four on one face, another four on the other face. So when you do a lateral image, the four on this face and the four on the other face will be here. The one which is closer to the tube will be projected larger or one that is closer to the imaging system will be smaller. So you see these four and these four. So these are all labeled A, B, C, D and things like that. Now using this, the center of the tumor is obtained. That is an interesting mathematics. They're very simple, but it's quite interesting. See, you look at this box now like this. When you do an imaging, you get these four fiducials and these four fiducial in the lateral and this four and this four in the anterior posterior image. So that is what you saw in the previous slide here. Now, if I know these coordinates, I don't need to worry about magnification here. I don't need to worry about the angle. Approximately lateral angle would do. It need not be exactly like isocentric here. But if I, because the position of these fiducials on the box is known, I know what the position of it, and I can use this to find the exact point, this is the target center, let me say. This is the target here, this is the target. 
So what we do is after we do the fill, the center of the lesion is marked by the neurosurgeon or a radiation oncologist. And we use a software to determine where the center is with reference to the BRW frame. What we do is we take AP and lateral and digitize these eight in the lateral and eight fiducials in the anterior, in the actual sequence that is provided by the software and also the target center. It determines the target center and tells you this is X, Y, Z. I did a small, uh, in between our computer failed and uh, we didn't have enough funding to go and buy another system because they said, you cannot buy the computer, the whole system is different. You buy another radio surgery system, which was very expensive. So I sat and developed a software those days. It was in 1999, if I remember 1999 or 2000. Uh, the idea is here, you have these four coordinates and four coordinates and this point. So you know where this point is with reference to this four coordinates or the eight coordinates that you see. So you can draw a line here. Similarly, you know this point with reference to these eight coordinates and you can draw a line here. Ideal situation, these two lines should meet if they had taken the same point on the lateral and on the AP, they should meet here. That is the target position. But when you write a software, the problem is they will not exactly take the same position. Nobody can take on the other. Even there is a sub millimeter or micro millimeter difference, these two are not going to meet. So when they don't meet, how do you get this point was the question. So what I did was a small mathematical relationship to find this least distance between these two lines and take, take the center of the distance, right, that line. And that was considered as the target point. Like you take the distance between these two lines, draw a line and put the center of it. And that was taken as the target position. And it worked out very well. And we used it for quite some time along with CT imaging and things. And then when we go to planning, uh, first we used a radionic system where we can, these are the nine rods that you see on the um, BRW frame that is digitized here. And uh, we fix the beams. You can see that we used to do arcs, normally four arcs. We used to digitize eye, optic, optic apparatus completely and brainstem mainly, and optic chiasm, which is also the part of optic apparatus. And we totally avoid them. No beam will go through any of this. We totally avoid and then uh, treat the rest of the, uh, treat the tumor, but we don't bother, much bother about the rest of the organ. And, uh, this is the planning uh, strategy we were using those days. And the other thing, when we learned about radio surgery, we were taught like this. Those days, the calculations were manual, right? We had to manually calculate. So they said it is like getting onto a flight. When you get onto a flight, the pilot has to check every system before they actually uh, start the flight. You can't take chances when you are on the sky. So the same concept was used. We never took chances. Right. Even the collimator, we had 1.5 and 2 centimeter, 3 centimeter collimator, which was selected for the patient. How do you know that you put the right one by mistake, you put the wrong one? There is no interlock system or anything those days. So what we used to do is we used to have a checklist. One fellow will shout the number, the other fellow will go and check. And both will have to sign the entire checklist. Similarly, the calculation also, uh, there will be two physics. One physics will do it, another physics will check it and the monetary unit calculation. Subsequently, everything became automated, so it's not an issue. But when we started, we had a complete checklist to check every aspect of radio surgery. So this is, we also do used to do a quality assurance for it. That is the WL test, Winston and Lust test, for which we put a radio opaque ball at the middle. We use the same angiographic localizer box and fix the radio opaque ball and align it to laser. And you can see that that's aligned to laser. And then we shoot uh, about five images with three gantry position and uh, three couch position to be precise. You know, this is couch zero and this is couch 90 and 270. And we find the difference between the circular center of the circular radiation field and the ball center. And if it is more than, it should be less than one millimeter always. And we hardly had any problem because our LINAC was very well maintained. And if it is more than that, we don't proceed unless we see what the problem with the ISO center.
And these are the ways we were treating at various angles. This was the initial LINAC that we used. Subsequently, we changed this cone system with a micro multi-leaf collimator of brain lab. And when we got this, actually not our machine, this is, I took it from Brunei Hospital where I worked for some time. It's an edge radio surgery uh, linear actuator. Uh, this is the one that we use. And we made a, uh, we used a phantom, head phantom. Actually, this is not a phantom for radio surgery. It looks very similar to what is being sold for radio surgery. But this is a nuclear medicine phantom, which I modified it for radio surgery and fixed it on a plate. And we could do all basic experiment, end-to-end -end test with this uh, when we started radio surgery. And subsequently also whenever a new system change was done, end-to-end -end testing, that is you do a, a radio uh, imaging, from imaging to delivery and verifying dose, completely was tested using this phantom. We also made our own phantom. I will show, show you one of them. This is when we got our micro multi-leaf collimator, but every time we had to load this collimator onto the linear accelerator. And uh, then we also subsequently started stereotactic radiotherapy. What is stereotactic radiotherapy? How different from stereotactic body radiotherapy? You know, those days when radio surgery started, instead of giving single fraction, some of the things we did, one of the things we did was to do fractionation but use the same concept of stereotactic localization. That is, you use the BRW frame, get the coordinates and use the coordinates to localize the patient, but fractionated, two gray per fraction. That we called a stereotactic radiotherapy. This for cranial or uh, you know, up to neck level, we were treating it with this. But for extracranial, where it comes to extracranial, it is stereotactic body radiotherapy. Here, we had to use a relocatable frame because the frame that we originally used for radio surgery was a fixed frame. It was an invasive frame. And because till the radio surgery is done, it is fixed onto the head. And we then after the radio surgery, we remove it. We can't fix it back in the same position. But for fractionated, we used what is called the GTC relocatable frame. Gil Thomas and I forgot the third name, uh, relocatable frame. And this has a mouth bite and an occipital plate. I will show you that. And we do a daily QA and we, for positioning accuracy, we used a depth helmet for quality assurance. This is the GTC frame. And we, this is the depth helmet and the measuring scale for it. It has got a mouth bite and occipital plate. So with, uh, even now this uh, stereotactic radiotherapy is being practiced. And you can see that you know, this is measured, the depth is measured and noted on a sheet and it's made sure it is not more than 2 mm uh, difference for any of the depths, right? You will mark it like this and make sure the depth are same as much as possible. Otherwise, we try to refix and make sure they get the same position. Um, sir, we have some yes, questions. Uh, the first question is, what kind of dosimetric protocol you were using for such a small field size for both reference dosimetry back in 1995? Excellent. Okay. Uh, we, you know what, when I started it, we didn't have all the small field dosimetry. Probably it was there, but I, I didn't understand. Probably no internet, no journal access as we have today. But um, what I did was I did two things. One is we used to do what we call chemical dosimeter. Right. Uh, we were one of the hospitals in India which had chemical dosimeter. That's how we later on we could move on to gel dosimetry also. And I'll show you the, sorry, I crossed that. Uh, uh, in this, in this, I could, I actually had a small cavity into that. And in that I put the chemical in, chemical dosimeter in. It's a very small cavity and exposed it to the uh, planned dose distribution and measured the dose. And then only we made, once we were sure that the dose is working, you know, it's chemical dose meter. It is not a, a big volume, but it is a fluid which can move around, right? So that's the only difference, but no protocol, nothing. But the other thing I did was um, I used the ion chambers, very small ion chamber we had, 0.07 cc at the time, which I actually kept it perpendicular, like, like this. 
Now they actually advocate that method, but those days we ourselves uh, discussed among our physics group and did it and found the effective point of measurement by finding out where you get the maximum dose and we mark the effective point of measurement. And we did the dosimetry by keeping the ion chamber straight like this. We had a capping tech one. I think it is 0.07 cc if I'm correct or 0.17 cc. We had that at the time. So that is the one, but our protocol was at the time was a British protocol that we used. What we regularly use for all the other uh, dose measurement in broad beam geometry, the same protocol was used. We didn't have a separate protocol for <coughs> small field. What is the other question? Another question is uh, the dose prescription is same for linac based radio surgery as of gamma knife one? No, no. I said gamma knife is 50%, right? Gamma knife is 50%. In this one is 80% isodose line in linac based. Okay. That so is the what, doses are uh, the for the linac the fractionated yeah. dose we yeah. can put uh, nominal dose as well 200 centigrade or there are the high doses uh, we we take the covering volume that is the 80 percent as two gray okay so the 100 will be 20 percent more than that okay and this two gray is for stereotactic radiotherapy yeah. for radio surgery we went up to 18 gray depending on the size of the lesion right Another question is uh, why we use different collimator in gamma knife? Oh, it is, depends on the size of the tumor only. Basically, you can manage both ways, right? Uh, it basically planning technique. I'm not a big expert on it. I only watched planning in gamma knife. But if the tumor uh, lesion is very small, why do you want to use a larger one? And if the tumor is larger one, you will have to using multiple shots to cover that. There you can use a little larger collimator. So that is why they are given you four different sizes, which actually became three different sizes in perfect shot. I, I missed that slide. Uh, we had four, eight, and I think 12 and 18, right? In actually perfect shot, it is four, eight, and 14, if I'm correct. There are only three collimator sizes in that. But you know, you know the, it is a basic logic only. For small, you actually use small. For big, you can you can always argue you can use multiple shots, but just to save time, why do you want to use multiple shots for a big one? When if you have a little bigger collimator, you can reduce the time of treatment. It's just basic logic in that. That's all. Okay, sir. Uh, you can continue. Yeah. So <laughs> I spoke about SRT, and this is the SRT fixation. We had the target sheets. This is again our own invention of printing the target sheets. Later on, Brain Lab system we bought the, that printed, but this printing was done by us. We had our own software to print the target sheets and fix it onto this box for relocatable thing. For regular radio surgery, it was not a problem. We had the arc system in which the marks are done. So that uh, vernier is there, which we can use here. We had to put a sheet on the box. So we used to print the sheet. So the difference between SRS and SRT for cranial lesions, it is single fraction where you use multiple in SRT, 10 to 40 collimator. Here we tried to go a little larger also, right? We made our own, fabricated our own collimator for it. And then 11 gray to 17 gray here, it is two gray or 1.8 gray per fraction, a regular conventional radiotherapy. Here you had a 80% isodose line covering, but SRT we had like radiotherapy 90 to 95%. Isodose line covering, right? Only for radio surgery, it is 80%. Radiotherapy is still 90 to 95% we don't have. And BRW frame we used here, we had a GTC relocatable frame, but for localization, we used the BRW frame, both for SRS and SRT. Here we try to avoid every critical organ. Here only we avoided the eye because when it's fractionated, little dose to brainstem and things like that are okay because they all come under within the limits, you don't really worry about that, right? Up to 54 gray for brain stuff should be okay. And then we did some phantom dosimetry. This is what I said, always we used to check this our own phantom we made for radio surgery. This is another one we used for radio surgery. We did end to end test them, end to end test. The names don't worry, these all we gave our own names to our own phantom, bullet phantom, and because it just looks like a bullet. Okay, and uh, this is purely perspex, and this is a water filled. That is the difference. 
here it's uh, fully perspective. The other thing is I can put a radio opaque ball here to test the isocenter accuracy. That was possible in this phantom. And I can also have TLD and the film and everything uh, keep into that. that. That is the main reason we fabricated this one. So we do a CT uh, with the BRW frame, you know, localizer. And then you can see that this is the ball. We contoured it and we selected the position and irradiated it. And we were able to look at the dose by keeping an ion chamber there, verify the dose. All these end-to-end -end testing, whenever we have a new system or a new software or any changes, we used to do this end-to-end -end testing on this, right? So the other frameless radio surgery, again, I would uh, like to give a disclaimer here. This is morely bookish knowledge. And uh, I have never worked with it, except I visited some centers. When I was writing a book, I wanted to learn about it. So I visited the centers. And uh, I never put my hand on it and worked on it. Uh, this is the exact track where you have the uh, two stereo imaging system on the ceiling and two cameras, which are X-ray tubes on the floor, in addition to the cone beam CT. And uh, the CyberNave system, it's slightly different as far as the imaging is concerned. The cameras are on the ceiling and the uh, imaging panels are on the floor. And the CyberNave system is a robotic radio surgery system. And initially, it started with cones. As you can see, these cones are here. It will automatically go and pick up. This is uh, actually an industrial robot on which a linear accelerator is fixed directly, a 6MV triple F linear accelerator. Actually, we never bothered about calling it triple F at the time. There is a flattening filter-free linear accelerator is kept, and it can produce relatively higher uh, uh, dose rate it could provide. And subsequently, the, it was it was robotic. It could go and fix the collimator. But subsequently, they went into the iris collimator where they can change the size without doing this picking up from here. And now the CyberNets I heard comes with MLC also. And you people will know better because you have CyberKnife. I hardly had an opportunity to work with the CyberKnife. And of course, uh, stereoscopic X-ray imaging, continuous imaging is being done and the robot moves based on the image data and multiple nodes are used to deliver. And as I said, it's a triple F beam that is used there. Now, talking about stereotactic body radiotherapy, do I have five more minutes or so? Can I continue for five, five minutes or 10 yes, minutes? Yes, we have time, sir. You can take more than that as well. Okay. Right. This is the last part of the uh, presentation. I'm going to talk about SBRT just for the sake of completion. You know, how does it differ from SRS? We have been doing SRS. Now we want to extend that to the whole body. So it's actually stereotactic body radiotherapy. I have seen in earlier days, they made body frames and everything, but none of them really worked very well. But now we were able to achieve SBRT without doing all those having all those frames. I will explain you that. Of course, there are some basic frames some people still use it, right? Like the abdominal compression and thing, but it's not like a stereotactic frame. The principles and practice of SBRT were transferred from cranial radio surgery. That's how all started. The frame-based stereotactic patient setup has been replaced with image guidance. So now they don't, even for cranial, they don't use the frame anymore. But in my hospital where I worked, CMC Velo, but even today they are using frame, but they got a, a, a you know, frameless uh, system, which is under commissioning, I was told. But one thing is frame-based is certainly you are sure that it is very nicely fixed and you cannot make a mistake there. When it goes to frameless, you have to do a lot of QA in addition to what you normally do because the frameless is like, you, you want to make sure the positioning continuously correct. When it's frame-based, the patient cannot move during treatment. Now you have to monitor throughout the treatment, okay? Uh, because uh, some keep render saying that the name stereotactic is misleading because when you go to the body, it is something what we do regularly for our radiotherapy. What is the big stereotaxy in it? But my contention is when you want to precise and have a three-dimensional coordinate system, 
it is stereotactic. So uh, we can still call it stereotactic body radiotherapy, but what is, how does it differ from our regular? which is also three, dim three qu dimensional coordinate system, but you are trying to be more accurate even if it's going to be SBRT. You want to be precise because you are going to treat very small lesions there. So SBRT is defined as a method of external beam radiotherapy that accurately delivers a high radiation dose to an extracranial target in one or few treatment fractions. So the second difference is in SRS, we did only single fraction. Of course, the fractionated SRS we did subsequently uh, for large AVMs, but generally it is single. But here, it's mostly uh, multiple fractions are used. Of course, single fraction also being used in SBRT. The radiobiological rationale for SBRT is similar to that SRS. That is, delivering a few fraction of large doses is relatively a short overall time results in more potent biological effect and rapid fall off of dose outside the target so that you avoid the normal tissues as much as possible. The clinical outcomes of SBRT compared favorably to surgery with minimal adverse effects. Limited number of treatment fractions are used, more convenient for patient and potentially a more cost-effective treatment. These are the advantages of SBRT. There are different sites we do for SBRT. Actually, it started with lung, it went to liver, spine, of course, spine was also done earlier, renal, prostate, and now they do meds also. So there are various locations we do that. And normally, SBRT, as per AAPM recommendation is, the lesion should be five, millimeter, five centimeter or less. But there are reports where they have gone up to seven centimeters, right? And the AAPM report also acknowledges that. So SBRT is also used as a boost in addition to regional nodal radiation. <laughs> How do you immobilize when you do SBRT? Uh, of course, you have to do scanning in treatment position like you do always. And uh, <clears throat> of course, I will talk about simulation also here. And normally you use a CT. People use PET CT because you want to pick up meds and MR is always useful. And the size thickness should be less than three millimeter or maximum three millimeter. You can't go larger than three millimeter. Immobilization, people can use whack lock or knee fixation and things like that. And you people use motion management. One is the free breathing, which is where they use internal target volume concept. But this is for the tumor movement is very low. And abdominal compression, as I showed you in the, one of the previous slides, uh, you can have a compression plate or a pressure belt or a body fix or breath hold CT. You know, all these are possible. And uh, abdominal compression is uh, a pressure belt. People have tried it, but people feel that there is one publication that I came across that says it cannot be very easily the same way it's not reproduced or something. But I'm sure there are other publications which support it because I see many people uh, use abdominal compression for uh, stereotactic body radiotherapy. Breath hold technique is a voluntary patient to hold uh, his, his, his or her breath at full inspiration or expiration. Patient trained or coached before treatment. I'll tell you, we do coaching for three days. And video coaching increases the patient cooperation. We also did a video coaching there. Image acquired during breath hold. Uh, free breathing imaging also occurred. I'll explain you the process that we do. This is something very interesting. This is not ours. You know, I was in an IAEA meeting in Japan a uh, few years ago. The, they had made a, a system for, uh, you know, to follow the uh, breathing, like this, uh, breath hold technique. So it is a very simple uh, thing, which is uses a arm and the arm moves uh, as the person breathes and an indicator is here to show how much uh, the person has breath uh, is breathing and you can have a full breath, uh, breathing and put a marker there and it should not change from the marker. I think it was used without con connecting to the computer control that time. But uh, that time it said they were saying they're working on uh, computer control. It is going to become uh, commercial also. By now I'm sure they should have a computer controlled one. This is what we use, the regular RPM device. 
Uh, we have fixed it on the CT simulator on the wall, this RPM camera, this is the infrared camera that we have. And because we fixed it on the wall, the QA becomes much more because the couch uh, moves, but this is stationary. If you fix it on the couch, then along with it, this will also move. So you need to worry only about the X, Y direction, not the Z one. But now we have to move, worry about the Z direction. But this is fine once you do this calibration with this ga gadget, which they call it a 10 point calibration. It works fine, right? And we also use uh, this uh, block mark, uh, neon reflector block, block, which is six dot block. And in the new LINAC, they are given a four dot one, but it's fine, you know, both uh, can be used. And uh, we used a Siemens CT here, which is a 4D CT. And uh, we also gave a goggle to the patient. As you can see here, I gave a video goggle to the patient and connected the video to the screen. So when you normally do a breath hold technique, the patient can see this graph and hold the breath at that level. So first three days, we train the patient and tell them just hold it here and the patient will hold it. And once the treatment is over, you just say, leave it and the patient will stop it. And then and say, take a deep breath and the patient will do it and look at it and exactly keep it there. So once you give three days training and then do the CT, when you do the CT, do both breath hold and free breathing and you choose which one you want when you do the plan. Sometimes uh, the movement is not much, you may go with free breathing also, right? Otherwise you may choose a breath cold one. So treatment plan, uh, you can use VMAT or multi, if you're using fixed beams, you have to use number of beams to have a fast, you know, very steep fall off of dose and uh, non-coplanar also you need to use if you're using fixed beams or you can use IMRT or VMAT and uh, Preferable to use a little higher dose so that you can finish faster, particularly when you're asking the patient to hold the breath and things like that. And choice of energy, it could be either six or 10. I will talk about that. Uh, generally, a six MB is preferred for lung. Higher the beam energy, what happens is if you use a higher energy here for lung, like 10, the larger penumbra will happen because of the lateral electron transport like the higher energy electron will travel a little further and the penumbral dose will increase, which will increase the lung dose. And because lung is a low density medium and likely to give more doses as it travels. And of course, the six heavy, you don't have a neutron issue also. Now, then you will have a very little neutron issue. So generally it is preferred six heavy for lung. Uh, 10 MV is used for liver and other uh, you know, pelvic or chest lesions. And uh, usually the dose we could deliver up to 18 gray in one fraction. And uh, short treatment time would help the uh, patient doesn't move or the organ doesn't move and will reduce the gated treatment time also. And uh, as I said, the choice could be conformal where you can use a 3D conformal beam, but most of the time people use VMAT, uh, single arc or double arc. The one I saw in Japan, they were using uh, mostly VMAT in Velour also. Initially, we started with 3D conformal radiotherapy. I think now they fully use VMAT for SBRT. And uh, treatment delivery, one important thing when during treatment delivery, you can look at the RPM device for the patient having the breath hold at the point, but you need to do a CBCT. What I have seen is if it is 18 gray and all, they break and do a CBCT in between to make sure the positioning is right and then continue. There will be three CBCTs. At the end of it, they may can do another three CBCT and make sure the patient position was right over the entire treatment. of uh, treatment. And uh, the dose uh, SBRT is about there are different dose levels in various protocol. I just took some of them, 41.8 gray in six fractions over two weeks for liver meds. Single fraction is BR dose 14 to 26. Uh, this is from University of Heidelberg and tertiary dose of 30 gray in five fractions. Um, lung, the initial phase one study assessing dose escalation using SCPRT for inoperable lung cancer used starting dose of 24 gray in three fraction and phase two they had 60 to 66 gray in three fractions. 
So these are some studies, not necessarily this is the gold standard or anything. I just picked up from some literatures. Thank you very much for your patient listening. I'll be happy to answer any question that you may have over this lecture. Participants can unmute themselves if they want to ask any questions. If there are no questions, uh, thank okay. you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. It's what an excellent presentation. And uh, you have shared your experience with us. It's uh, quite great. And we hope we will get you again for more information or for more advanced topics. We can uh, have you uh, near future. Sure. Uh, thank you. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, you can say a few uh, words if you like. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting. I'm really honored and privileged to talk to a group. I keep noticing, you know, keep looking at it, LinkedIn and other areas as well. And I met a few of your colleagues in the IEA meeting in Japan in 2019, if I remember correctly, early 19. Uh, I don't know many of them who came there are there in this uh, webinar, but I remember meeting a few of your people there. Uh, including physics and RTT and radiation oncologists there. It is always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you very much for inviting and we look forward to more such interactions with your group in future. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you all for participating and uh, we will get with another webinar soon. Thank you.